Biblical Inaccuracy and John 3:16 Part 4 an analysis of the famous biblical verse, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Part 5 of 5 Description, More Reasons Why We Should Not Believe in John 3 verse 16 To recap, in the last four episodes of this series we discussed the following regarding John 3. 16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. 1. The Gospel book of Christian scripture known as, John, almost certainly was not written by Jesus' disciple John. 2. In John 3 verse 16, as with elsewhere in the Bible, translators illegitimately capitalized, him, to make Jesus look like God. 3. Because the Bible is internally inconsistent and factually unreliable, it does not fulfill the basic requirements expected of sacred scripture. 4. The foundational ideology, the alleged crucifixion, resurrection and atoning sacrifice, is so flawed we cannot reasonably rely upon John 3. 16, or, for that matter, upon the Bible as a whole, for salvation. Which brings us to a discussion of why anybody believes John 3 verse 16 to be true, when so much evidence is stacked against it. The simple fact of the matter is that John 3 verse 16 appeals to Christians, whether true or not. In the previous episode in this series, I discussed just a few of the fallacies of the concept of Jesus' atoning sacrifice. I saved the best for last, and it is this, according to the Bible, God doesn't even want a sacrifice. Now, let's leave aside the common sense arguments, that forgiveness doesn't have a price, that one person cannot atone for another. That if God had wanted, He would have forgiven mankind on that basis alone. Etc and dwell solely upon the fact that the Bible tells us God doesn't want sacrifice in the first place, Hosea 6. 6 reads, I desire mercy, and not sacrifice. Sure, this is Old Testament, but Matthew 9 verse 13 and 12 colon 7 both reference this verse, so it applies to the New Testament as well. So, what is the argument again? That God needed a sacrifice that He doesn't even want? This concept is problematic, at best. There are plenty of other reasons why we shouldn't believe John 3 verse 16, and one of the best is not that we can't believe John 3. 16, but that we can't be sure about anything in the Gospel according to John. Despite the fact that nobody even knows who authored John. The Jesus Seminar analyzed the words attributed to Jesus in the Gospel of John and were unable to find a single saying they could with certainty trace back to the historical Jesus. The words attributed to Jesus in the fourth Gospel are the creation of the evangelist for the most part. Funk, Robert W., Roy W. Hoover, and the Jesus Seminar The Five Gospels, The Search for the Authentic Words of Jesus Page 10 Now, why would, the evangelist, do such a thing? We are told the reason is as follows, Jesus' followers were inclined to adopt and adapt his words to their own needs. This led them to invent narrative contexts based on their own experience, into which they imported Jesus as the authority figure. Funk, Robert W., page 21. The Jesus Seminar documents hundreds of examples in the Gospel books, including cases where, the followers of Jesus borrowed freely from common wisdom and coined their own sayings and parables, which they then attributed to Jesus. Funk, Robert W., page 22. This does not discredit just John 3 verse 16, but in fact it discredits all of John. By extension, if the Bible is filled with contradictions, how can we know what is true and what isn't, anywhere in the Bible? As the old saying goes, the whistle does not pull the train. Christians might like how John 3 verse 16 sounds, but that does not make it true. In fact, the more we examine the verse, the more reasons we find to discredit it. Another old saying is that the bait hides the hook. John 3 verse 16 is the bait, through which evangelists hope to hook and reel people into their smug, and entirely illegitimate, conclusions. They tell us God gave His only begotten Son, without critically analyzing this concept. If Jesus is the only begotten Son of God, why does Psalms 2 verse 7 say this about David? The Lord has said to me, You are my son, today I have begotten you. Jesus the only begotten Son of God, with David a son, begotten by God a scant forty generations earlier? The Bible can have one only of something, but not two only s of the same thing. 
The Bible describes many people, Israel and Adam included, as sons of God. Both 2 Samuel 7 verses 13 and 14 and 1 Chronicles 22. 10 read, He, Solomon, shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. In the Bible, only begotten, is translated from the ancient Greek monogenes, Kittle, Gerhard and Gerhard Friedrich, editors. 1985, Theological Dictionary of the New Testament. Translated by Jeffrey W. Bromley. William B. Eerdmans Publishing Co., Paternoster Press Limited, page 607. And yet, Isaac is monogenes in Heb. 11 colon 17, Ibid. Ishmael was born 14 years before Isaac, and both were alive when their father, Abraham, passed on. At no time was Isaac ever Abraham's only begotten son. So is only begotten a mistranslation of monogenes, or is Heb. 11.17 a.m. mistake? If it's a mistranslation, then John 3 verse 16 must be mistranslated as well. If it's a mistake, we can't trust the Bible as a whole, a repeating refrain in these discussions. George Petty once amended the old proverb, to err is human, to forgive is divine. By adding, and to persist in error, beastly. The self-righteous, I've got the Holy Spirit inside me and can do no wrong, attitude of the John 3. 16 errors is offensive for as many reasons as it is wrong. For one thing, it sounds too much like the lawyer's maxim to argue facts and law when they serve the purpose, and holler when they don't. If I am permitted to echo Voltaire's conclusion, doubt is not a pleasant condition, but certainty in the face of contrary evidence is an absolutely absurd one. Despite the strength of the evidence against John 3 verse 16, most Christians refuse to acknowledge the illegitimacy of the verse. And maybe non-Christians should accept that. Matthew 5 verse 9 reports Jesus as having said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. So perhaps we should forget about trying to win this argument, and make peace over it. If we can't unite on creeds, let's at least unite on kind and charitable deeds. Let's become blessed peacemakers who are called sons of God. Then, let's point out that this is just one more biblical verse that contradicts John 3 16 s exclusive, Son of God, concept. Nothing says we can't make peace, and continue to politely press our point at the same time. But that, to me, is an important element to any religious dialogue, keep it light and polite, but maintain focus. To grasp the present, we must understand the past. In order to understand the influence of paganism on the doctrine of the Trinity, we need to first understand the world into which Christianity was born and developed. The early followers of Jesus were followers of Judaism. In fact, Christianity started out as a movement within Judaism. Like Jews since the time of Moses, these early believers kept the Sabbath, were circumcised and worshipped in the Temple. The only thing that distinguished the early followers of Jesus from any other Jews was their belief in Jesus as the Messiah, that is, the one chosen by God who would redeem the Jewish people. Many Christian scholars agree that authors of the New Testament such as Matthew were Jewish believers in Jesus. The influence of Judaism on the New Testament is important because it helps us to correctly understand its message. The New Testament is full of terminology like, Son of God. Such language is interpreted literally by Christians today to mean that Jesus is God the Son, but is this correct? What was the intention behind the Jewish writers of the New Testament when they used such language? What did these terms mean at the time of Jesus? The language of the Bible. When we turn to the Old Testament we find that such language permeates its pages. For example, Moses calls God, Father. Is this the way you repay the Lord, you foolish and unwise people? Is he not your father, your creator, who made you and formed you? Deuteronomy 32 verse 6. Angels are referred to as, sons of God, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Job 1 verse 6. The Old Testament even goes so far as to call Moses a god, and the Lord said unto Moses, See, I have made thee a god to Pharaoh and Aaron thy brother shall be thy prophet. Exodus 7 verse 1. The Israelites are also referred to as, gods, I said, you are, gods, you are all sons of the Most High. Psalm 82 verse 6. What we can conclude is that such highly exalted language was commonplace and is intended figuratively, it is not a literal indication of divinity. 
Even as late as the end of the first century, when the New Testament writers started penning their accounts of the life of Jesus, Jewish people were still using such language figuratively. In a conversation between Jesus and some Jewish teachers of the law, they say to Jesus, The only Father we have is God Himself. John 8 verse 41 The Gospel of Luke calls Adam a son of God when it recounts the lineage of Jesus, the son of Anosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Luke 3 verse 38 Jesus even says that anyone who makes peace is a child of God, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Matthew 5 verse 9 If the New Testament writers understood such language to be a claim to divinity, then they would have used it exclusively in relation to Jesus. Clearly, it denotes a person that is righteous before God and nothing more. So we can see that such language, in and of itself, does not denote the divinity of Jesus. So where did such ideas come from? The mindset of the people who received the gospel message. The turning point in history came when Christianity ceased being a small movement within Judaism and Gentiles, non-Jews, started to embrace the faith in large numbers. We need to look to the pagan world of the Gentiles in order to understand the mindset of the people that received the New Testament message. Since the time of Alexander the Great, Gentiles had been living in a Hellenistic, Greek, world. Their lands were dominated by Roman armies, with the Roman Empire being the superpower of the world at the time. The Roman Empire itself was heavily influenced by Hellenistic religion, philosophy and culture. Greek gods and goddesses like Zeus, Hermes and Aphrodite, as well as Roman gods and goddesses like Jupiter, Venus and Diana, dominated the landscape. There were temples, priesthoods, and feasts dedicated to the patron god or goddess of a city or region, statues to the deities dotted the forums of the cities. Even rulers themselves were frequently worshipped as gods. Gentiles from such a polytheistic background would have naturally understood Christian preaching about the Son of God, in light of a Greek or Roman god having been begotten by another. We can see this mindset manifested in the New Testament. In the book of Acts there is an incident where the Gentile crowds think that Paul is Zeus come among them when he heals a crippled man. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lycaonian language, The gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bowls and wreaths to the city gates because he and the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd, shouting. Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We are bringing you good news, telling you to turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made heaven and earth and sea and everything in them. Acts 14 verses 11 to 15 Here we see that the Greco-Roman peoples that Paul and Barnabas were preaching to were in the habit of taking humans for gods. Despite Paul protesting that he was not a god, the people persisted in their belief, even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowd from sacrificing to them. Acts 14 verse 18 from this example we can see that according to Christian history, it was a common practice for people to attribute divinity to other humans. In spite of Paul openly denying being a god, the people continued to worship and sacrifice to him. We can conclude that even if Jesus himself rejected being god at that time, the mindset of the people was such that they would still have found a way to deify him. With this background in mind, it's easy to see how Judaic phrases like, Son of God, took on a different meaning when transported out of their Jewish monotheistic context into pagan Greco-Roman thought. The Trinity doctrine arose neither in a vacuum, nor strictly from the text of Scripture. It was the result of the influence of certain beliefs and attitudes that prevailed in and around the Church after the first century. The Church emerged in a Jewish and Greek world and so the primitive Church had to reconcile the notions they had inherited from Judaism with those they had derived from pagan mythology. In the words of the historian and Anglican Bishop John Wand, Jew and Greek had to meet in Christ, John William Charles Wand. 1955, The Four Great Heresies, page 39. Links to the Paganism of Old It's interesting to note that the Greco-Roman religions were filled with tales of gods procreating with human beings and begetting godmen. 
The belief that God could be incarnate, or that there were sons of God, were common and popular beliefs. For example, the chief god in the Greek pantheon, Zeus, visited the human woman Danae in the form of golden rain and fathered Perseus, a god-man. In another tale Zeus is said to have come to the human woman Alcmena, disguised as her husband. Alcmena bore Hercules, another god-man. Such tales bear a striking similarity to Trinitarian beliefs of God being begotten as a man. In fact, the early Christian apologist Justin Martyr, considered a saint in the Catholic Church, said the following in response to pagan criticisms that Christianity borrowed from their beliefs about the sons of God. When we say that the Word, who is our teacher, Jesus Christ the firstborn of God, was produced without sexual union, and that he was crucified and died and rose again, and ascended to heaven. We propound nothing new or different from what you, pagans, believe regarding those whom you consider sons of Jupiter. Justin Martyr, The First Apology, Chapter 21 According to ancient Roman myth, Jupiter was the king of all the gods. Here Justin Martyr is telling Roman pagans that what the Christians believe about Jesus being the Son of God is nothing different than what they believe about the sons of the god Jupiter. That the Church Fathers' conception of the Trinity was a combination of Jewish monotheism and pagan polytheism can be seen in the testimony of Gregory of Nyssa, a 4th-century bishop who is venerated as a saint in the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. He also happens to be one of the great figures in the history of the philosophical formulation of the doctrine of the Trinity. He wrote, For the truth passes in the mean between these two conceptions, destroying each heresy, and yet, accepting what is useful to it from each. The Jewish dogma is destroyed by the acceptance of the Word and by belief in the Spirit. While the polytheistic error of the Greek school is made to vanish by the unity of the nature abrogating this imagination of plurality. Dr. H. Wolfson, The Philosophy of the Church Fathers, pp. 361-363 the Christian conception of God, argues Gregory of Nyssa, is neither purely the polytheism of the Greeks nor purely the monotheism of the Jews, but rather a combination of both. Even the concept of God-men who were saviors of mankind was by no means exclusive to Jesus. Long before Jesus was born, it was not uncommon for military men and political rulers to be talked about as divine beings. More than that, they were even treated as divine beings, given temples, with priests, who would perform sacrifices in their honor, in the presence of statues of them. In Athens for example, Demetrios Poliorcetes, Demetrios the Conqueror of Cities, 337, 283 BCE, was acclaimed as a divine being by hymn writers because he liberated them from their Macedonian enemies. How the greatest and dearest of the gods are present in our city. For the circumstances have brought together Demeter and Demetrios, she comes to celebrate the solemn mysteries of the Kore, while he is here full of joy, as befits the god, fair and laughing. His appearance is solemn, his friends all around him and he in their midst, as though they were stars and he the sun. Hail boy of the most powerful god Poseidon and Aphrodite. For other gods are either far away, or they do not have ears, or they do not exist, or do not take any notice of us, but you we can see present here, not made of wood or stone, but real. So we pray to you, first make peace, dearest, for you have the power. Angelos Chaniotis, the Ithophallic hymn for Demetrios Poliorcetes and Hellenistic religious mentality, page 160. The Athenians gave Demetrios an arrival that was fit for a god, burning incense on altars and making offerings to their new deified king. It must be pointed out that as time passed by, he did some other things that the Athenians did not approve of, and as a consequence they revoked their adoration of him. It seems that in the days before Jesus, divinity could be stripped away from human beings just as easily as it was granted. Perhaps the best known examples of God-men are the divine honors bestowed upon the rulers of the Roman Empire, starting with Julius Caesar. We have an inscription dedicated to him in 49 BCE discovered in the city of Ephesus, which says this about him. 
Iris Suleimani, Diodorus Mythistory and the Pagan Mission, Historiography and Culture, page 288. Descendant of Ares and Aphrodite. The God who has become manifest. And universal savior of human life. So Julius Caesar was believed to be God manifest as man, the savior of mankind. Sound familiar? Now prior to Julius Caesar, rulers in the city of Rome itself were not granted divine honors. But Caesar himself was, before he died, the Senate approved the building of a temple for him, a cult statue, and a priest. Soon after his death, his adopted son and heir, Octavian, promoted the idea that at his death, Caesar had been taken up to heaven and been made a god to live with the gods. There was a good reason that Octavian wanted his adopted father to be declared a god. If his father was god, then what does that make him? This deification of Caesar set the precedent for what was to happen with the emperors, beginning with the first of them, Octavian himself, who became Caesar Augustus in 29 BCE. There is an inscription that survives from his lifetime found in the city of Halicarnassus, modern Turkey, which calls Augustus. Hans Joseph Klauck, Religious Context of Early Christianity, A Guide to Greco Roman Religions, p. 296. The Native Zeus and Savior of the Human Race. This is yet another example of a divine savior of mankind. Now Octavian happened to also be the son of God by virtue of his divine father Julius Caesar. In fact Octavian became known as D.V. Phileas, son of the Divine One. These, of course, are all titles widely used by Christians today to describe Jesus. We must realize that the early church did not come up with these titles out of the blue, they are all things said of other men before they were said of Jesus. For early Christians, the idea was not that Jesus was the only person who was ever called such things, this is a misconception. The concept of a divine human being who was the savior of mankind was a sort of template that was applied to people of great power and authority. We've seen that the history of paganism is littered with such examples, and Jesus was just another divine savior in a long list of divine saviors that had preceded him.